partner with us, we would appreciate that. It helps us go into the world, take this message out there. There's no set fee or amount that you have to, you know, pledge or anything like that, that kind of stuff. If you join up as a partner, you get uh, a CD per month, sometimes a DVD, uh, a teaching newsletter, uh, kind of an update on what's going on. And then we also have a place on our website you can go in and sign in, and we're making it where you can get some free downloads and all kinds of stuff like that. And then we're going to start doing partner uh, meetings. When I go places, if you're a partner in that area, we'll, we will meet with you like the day before, kind of just a you know, informal gathering to talk and tell you what's going on, that kind of stuff. So if you'd like to be a partner, please sign up with us. We can use partners for sure. And so that's all we're going to say about that. Now, all right. <clears throat> I'm going to give you two things, and we'll see. I might, ha I might have to save this other one until tonight just cause, so I have the time. But I want to give you two things. <clears throat> Number one, go with me to Acts chapter 3. No. Acts chapter 3. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Acts chapter 3. Comes right after Acts chapter 2. Okay. So that tells us they have already received the Holy Ghost. Isn't that right? Amen. Now, Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them, that entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. Now we know an alms is like a, an offering, it's a money, it's a gift, it's a charity, right? Now, two things. First off, Peter and John, they get up, they're heading to the temple. Why are they going to the temple? To pray. They're going at the hour of prayer, so they're going there to pray. Now they haven't prayed yet, but they're going there to pray. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And they hadn't even gone in the temple yet. So this man, now watch. Verse 3 said, Who seeing Peter and John about to go to the temple, ask an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. Now we're just going to take this piece by piece. First off, that's, that's strike one for Peter. Right? I mean, come on, everybody in this room has been trained well enough to know you don't say, Hey, look at me. Yeah, look yeah. Right? But that's what he said, right? Right. Funny thing is, what Peter did works, and what we do as a church doesn't. Okay? So maybe he knew something that we did, right? Now watch. He says, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Now, it says, then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. Now, stop right there, because that's strike number two. Right? Everybody knows that you can't say, oh, what I got, I just give you. We've got to pray and say, okay, first off, we, have to, we don't tell them to look at us. We tell them to look to Jesus. Right? You look to Jesus, and let's see what Jesus wants to do for you. Right? And then what everybody, generally, that's what the church does. That's not what Peter did. Peter said, there, look right here. Look right here. Your help is right here. Now, and he says, matter of fact, what I got, I give you. Do you hear the difference between first century Christianity and modern Christianity. Yeah. <clears throat> he says, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So he gave him a command. And apparently he didn't wait for the man. Because verse 7 says, And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Now watch. So now get this. He looks at him and says, Look on us. Right? That's point number one. Then he says, What I got I give you. Right? That's point number two. And we're just kind of taking it step by step. Then he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. Right? That's three. Then he took him by the right hand. That's four. Right? Then he lifted him. That's number five. Okay, we're just going through it. Now watch this. And when he lifted him, now watch, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. You notice Peter commanded him to walk and then used the name of Jesus and then raised him up and he, the man's legs and ankle bones, did not receive strength until he lifted him. You hear that? Didn't happen ahead of time. So when he lifted him, he was still weak. 
His feet couldn't walk. He was still lame until he lifted him, and then he got strength. Right? Now, he says, And he, leaping up, stood and walked, and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, You men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? Now, do you realize that this verse, this whole passage especially, but this verse too, pretty much destroys all healing teaching that's out there? Yeah. Why do you look at us as though by our own power or holiness? Wait, what does he say? Remember, they hadn't prayed yet. They, they were going to the temple to pray. Right? They, they weren't prayed up. They hadn't been in there praying and fasting. Right? They are on their way. Right? And then he said, now watch. And he said, as though by our own power or holiness. In other words, our own power, our own anointing, our gifting, by this power in us. And why do you look at us as though we're special? Or that we live so holy that God would use us to do this. Our own holiness. We, we live so perfect. He said, that's not the case. He said, why do you look at us like that? Then he takes his chance to preach. Remember, because they just crucified Jesus shortly before that. So he says, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus. And you know when he said Jesus, they're like, uh-oh. Isn't, isn't that that... You know, false Messiah we crucified a couple of weeks ago, you know. Whom you delivered up. So what's he doing? He's pointing the finger at him. Whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. And killed the Prince of Life, whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Now he's going to tell you how he did it. He says, in his name... Through faith in his name hath made this man strong. He said, why are you looking at us like we did this? We didn't do this. Is the name of Jesus and faith in that name. Right. You hear that? The name of Jesus and faith in that name has made this man strong. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, <clears throat> you can go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 16. While you turn there, I'm going to comment. Okay? How do you get saved? Through faith. Through faith in what? There is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. It's the name of Jesus. Isn't that right? So it's the name of Jesus and faith in that name that got you saved. Is that right? How many of you are saved? So what you're saying is you have the name of Jesus and faith in that name. Is that correct? Now, isn't that what Peter just said he used to heal the lame man? He didn't say it was a gift. He didn't say it was anointing. He didn't say it was anything. He said it, it wasn't his own power or his own holiness. He just said it was the name of Jesus and faith in that name. Yes. The very thing that you say you have. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then if we stopped right there, you could go out of here saying, I have what it takes to heal the lame. Yes. Amen. Right? Yes. right? Isn't that simple? Yes. He said, yeah, but I'm not sure about me. And there you go. There you go. <laughs> we were talking about that the other day. I was coming upstairs and I was running late and we were... We told them they, they, some other guys were on the elevator, and they said, oh, good, we're not late because, you know, you're, you're there. And I said, yeah, they can't very well start without me. And I said, but if they do, then I'll know they have the message. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> but you have to realize, again, enter that rest. Rest from your works. Don't put faith in your faith. Don't put faith in you. You understand? Don't make it rely on you at all. The more you get away from that, the more things will work for you. You know, just if you can ever just not think about you or any input you have into it, as far as well, yeah, but you know, <clears throat> I hadn't been like this or I haven't done that or I no, what does that got to do with it? It's the name of Jesus. Remember, two, if you remember two scriptures, remember this: Acts three sixteen, the name of Jesus and faith in that name, right? And then remember John fourteen twelve. 
<clears throat> that the same works, he that believes on me, that's us, the same works that I do shall he do, and greater than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. The only three requirements there, okay, is the name of Jesus, faith in that name, Jesus went to the Father. That's it. Okay? Now, <clears throat> Mark 16. In the, actually several places, but also mainly in Romans in chapter 8, it talks about the Holy Spirit who is our helper. And in some places, even in the Gospels, it talks about that he will send a helper or a comforter. He said, I won't leave you an orphan, but I will send you a, a comforter, a helper. Okay? Now that word there is the Greek word paraclete. And it means literally one called alongside to help. Right? That's why it's called the helper. Now to hear what you have to remember is this. The Holy Spirit is the helper. He is not the doer. He's the helper. See, that's where the church... See, we talk about the backwards church. You know, things always doing things... The church always doing things backwards. You know? You tell everybody, no, come to Jesus. You go out, you witness, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. If you just come to Jesus, you know, well, I got to straighten my life up. No, no, you, you cannot straighten your life up enough to be acceptable. Just come to him as you are, right? If you come to him as you are, he will accept you. Just come as you are. And it's all it takes. It's by grace. It's not by you cleaning yourself up. Oh, okay. And then they get saved. And they come to church. Somebody comes in and starts preaching and says, listen, you need to get healed. If you need to get healed, come on up here right now. You walk down front and you say, you know, I've been working on this thing and got this problem. And, and they say, well, well, what, you know, what's the matter? Well, I got this. Well, were you born again? Yeah, I'm born again. Okay, is there any sin in your life? Yeah, there's some things. That, well, you dirty dog, go back and sit down. <laughs> God ain't going to help you till you get all the sin out of your life. <laughs> now, wait a minute. We're telling two different stories because it'd be better for him to stay on the street. On the street, it's all by grace. You get in church, it's all by works. <laughs> Isn't that right? I mean, come on, that's the way the church preaches it. Yeah, is it by grace or is it not? But see, we, we, try, we turn it around. It's better to stay a sinner on the street where God will show mercy and have grace than it is coming to church and have to get it all by works. So now watch. <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit is called the helper. Okay? James 1.22 says, Be therefore doers of the word, not hearers only, thereby deceiving your own selves. So we're the doer of the word. Is that right? We are to be doers of the word. Amen. So who's the doer? Amen. We're the doer. Okay? The Holy Spirit is the helper. Who's the helper? Now remember those two positions, the doer and the helper. You're the doer, he's the helper. He's not the doer, and you're not the helper. So you get into trouble when you try to help. Yep. So you stand around and want to help the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's waiting to help you, but before he can help you, you've got to do. So he can help exactly, you understand that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you're the doer, he's the helper. Now what are you going to do? Are you going to do the work? No, you're going to do the word. You're going to do the Word. Be doers of the Word, right? Now, what does the Word say? Lay hands on the sick. That's not a work. That's a Word. I mean, you're doing the Word. You're not doing the work. You're doing the Word, right? So, now, if you do the Word, what is His job? To help. And when, you, when He helps, He's got to do the work, right? All right, let's read this. Now, watch. <clears throat> Wait, you can't do the work because you see from your works. Right. Remember? He, he's going to do the works. So the works he does through you, he's doing, but you've ceased from your works. So it's not your work. You're just doing the word, and he does the work through you. Right? Remember that? Okay. So I'm trying to help you get you out of the way as much as I can. All right? Now, Mark 16, verse 15. We're going to read through him. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. What's going to follow them that believe? Signs. Signs. Okay. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, you agree with all that? Yes. Why? Because you're a believer. Yes. Right? Okay. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Now notice, I'm going to show you piece by piece. Let's look at that last verse. They went forth and preached everywhere. Where did they preach? Everywhere. Oh, they didn't stay in the temple? No. They didn't wait for the, people, for the world to come to them? No. So they went out into the world? Yes. Okay. So it's funny. 
That's what it says. Go ye into all the Walmarts. That's what it says. <laughs> okay? Now, now watch this. They went. They went, right? They went forth, preached everywhere. They went. Now when they now notice until they went, signs could not follow. See if I if I'm standing here, you can't stand here. Right? You can't follow in my footsteps until I have footsteps for you to follow in. You understand? Right. You can't follow me until I move. If I'm, if I'm standing here and you're standing here, you can't follow me. You understand? Right. For signs to follow me, I have to be moving. Because yeah. otherwise, we're both just standing there. Mm -hmm. Right? You got that? Okay. Now watch. <clears throat> they went forth and preached everywhere. Now watch. The Lord... Now, in your Bible, the word them. Is that in italics? Or is it not there? I mean, some, some modern translations, it's, it's not there. <clears throat> in the King James, it's in italics. That means it's not in the Greek. Yeah, what word is what verse is that? Them. Verse, verse 20. Verse 20. And they went forth, preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, is the way the King James says it, but it's in italics. So what I tell you to do when you see italics? Read it with it and read it without it. Right? So let's read it without it. And, the, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with and confirming the word. What was the Lord working with? The Word. The Word, right? What was He confirming? The Word. The Word, right? Notice He wasn't confirming apostles. He wasn't confirming a man. He was confirming the Word. You get it? And confirming the Word with signs following. Okay? Now, <clears throat> now notice. If I was an electrician, I came in here and wanted to rewire the thing. Okay? Then, and if I'm an electrician, a certified electrician, you know, licensed, then I'm going to have a helper, right? Somebody with me, an assistant, right? Now, I, according to the state law, I'm the one that's supposed to do the stuff, right? They can help me, but I couldn't say do this and walk off, right? I'd have to be there because they're not licensed. Now, I, you know, don't get too specific on this, but I'm trying to give you an idea here. I'm trying to get you to see something. So I came in, I said all this stuff, and I said, and I had this helper, and I said, okay, here's what we need. I need three rolls of wire, need the ladder, need the, and I start going through this. And if this helper is a good helper, if he's been around me a while, we work together, and he knows how I work, then he'd say, oh, yeah, and over that corner, you're going to need the, you know, the elbow conduit, and we're going to need this. And Yeah, it's good. I'm glad you saw that. Yeah, that. And he's making a list of everything we need. And then when he makes it, we, we scope out the job, and then I get ready to go. I say, okay, I'm going to go pick up some stuff. And I'll be back in a few minutes to get everything ready. I leave. He lays everything where I need. He'd have the wire laid out, have the tools where I need them, have the connectors, all that right where I need it. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. So when I get back out here, <clears throat> we'd climb up on that ladder, and I would start putting this stuff in. And then as I needed something, I, if, you know, where I'm standing there working, I'm putting this stuff up, and I go, I need this. I need the pliers. Okay, he hands me the pliers to him. Okay? And I go through it, and everything I need, if we've worked together a lot, he's not just looking what I'm doing. He's looking where I'm going. And, and if he's a good helper and we've worked together, at some point, I would turn and go, okay, I'm going to need the, and he's already saying, he's going to put it in my hand, right? And I'm going to turn and get it without even having to tell him. He's going to put it in my hand. He's going to put in my hand what I need before I even have to tell him. You get it? Why? Because he's a good helper, right? Now, he can help me do it, but he can't do it legally, right? Why? Because I'm the doer. I'm, I'm, I'm the, the licensed one, right? The paraclete, one called alongside to help. The Holy Spirit's job is to come along beside you, help you do the word. See, he helps you do. You do, he helps. Signs follow. Now, now notice this. It says, these signs shall follow them. And confirming the word with signs following. Where are the signs? Following. following. That means behind you. Not in front of you. So signs follow you. You don't follow signs, right? right. Now, you're doing the word, right? Yeah. Who, may, who, who is the one doing the healing? The actual makes the healing. The Holy Spirit, right? Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, right? So if he's the one, he is the one that actually makes the sign happen. Right? Mm -hmm. So if he's the one that makes the sign happen and the signs are following, then where's the Holy Spirit? Following. He's following me. I'm not following him. He's following me. Do you understand that? Yeah. Now, this isn't blasphemous. This is the Bible. Right? 
I'm not following the Holy Ghost. Well, we're just going to follow the Holy Ghost. No, you're not. He's following you. He's waiting on you. The helper, he follows you. The helper follows you. Do you understand? Yeah. If you don't move, he can't move. Mm. Sure. See, you're waiting on him to move. He's waiting on you to move. The helper helps you do the job. Amen. The signs follow you. The signs don't precede you. See, you've got to go into all the world and preach the gospel. He helps you accomplish the work by the signs following. The signs are following you because you're preaching the word and he's confirming the word and you're going, and that's where it comes from. You see that? That's where the Holy Spirit... Now, now listen. Don't get all bent out of shape because you think I'm saying we're not following God. I'm not say, I didn't say we weren't following God. I'm saying that the Holy Spirit accompanies us, follows us, and is with us. Now, the Holy Spirit that, we're, that we are following, okay? The Holy Spirit follow, follows us, but the Spirit we are following is the Spirit of God. It is the Holy Spirit, but He abides in us, yes. right? And He directs us even if we don't know we're being directed. Mm -hmm. It's in there. He's already... God, the, the desire you have, okay, Philippians 2.13 says, It is God in you, who is in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The willing to do it is God. So when you want to do it, that's when you're being, you understand, that's when you're following him. That want to, he's in you making you want to, right? Because you've given your heart and life to him. But the, so in that way, you're following him, but he's following you. You see that? He, remember, we talked about earlier, me and you, you and him, I'm and you, and you're and him. See, okay, I know, it's quantum physics. See, you get quantum physics, it straightens it all out. But if you just talk about all this stuff, it gets all jumbled up. Mm -hmm. So, he's in you, and you're following him, you're being led by him, you're walking with him, but he's also following you by performing the, the actual sign itself and making it happen, because you're a doer of the work, and he's a helper. Mm -hmm. Amen, you see that? Amen. Now, <clears throat> all right, let me, ooh, we're doing pretty good. And I'm using the wrong book. There we go. I'm going to go in the back of the manual here. Whoa. Okay. I'm going to read these to you very quickly and prepare you for tonight. Okay? Because tonight we're going to talk about the anointing, how it works, how it operates, and then show you how to minister, and then we're going to get you activated. Okay? 78, page 78 of the manual. Now this was written by Gordon Lindsay, who traveled with John Lake, knew John Lake personally. And this is out of his book called Apostle to Africa, John G. Lake, Apostle to Africa. This is actually out of the very front of the book. It's called Some Personal Memories of Dr. John G. Lake. He says, it is an underestimate <clears throat> to say that the ministry of John G. Lake was unusual. He possessed the remarkable ability to create faith in his hearers. Ministers who sat under him soon found that they too had a ministry of faith that resulted in healings of a most startling character. Since it was impossible for Dr. Lake to minister personally to the great numbers that sought his services, he usually had a band of lay ministers and workers laboring with him. They were called divine healing technicians to answer calls to which he was unable to attend. One of the writer's first memories, that'd be Gordon Lindsay, of a healing was that of a woman who was instantly healed as a result of the prayers of one of Dr. Lake's ministers. Now notice, not Dr. Lake, but a man that had been trained by him. The woman was a Mrs. Watts, wife of a prominent officer of a local church. So her husband, not Dr. Lake's church, but her husband was a big wig, okay? Yeah, minister, uh, officer in the church. This woman had become seriously ill, and the physicians decided that her only hope was an immediate operation. The cost of the proposed operation was well beyond the family's financial resources at the time. However, in desperation, the husband went to a local bank and arranged for a loan to pay the cost of the operation. In the meantime, the writer's mother, Gordon Lindsay's mom, who had great faith in divine healing, felt a burden to pray for the family. She went to the sick woman and encouraged her to believe God for healing. But her church had taught against divine healing, the sick woman. <clears throat> and in fact, the woman herself had not taken any interest in this teaching. But as is often the case when desperate illness or death faces one, they are inclined to alter their views. <clears throat> the lady consented that prayer should be offered for her healing. Mother then took the next train to Portland in hope of getting Dr. Lake to come to pray for the woman. However, when she arrived there, he was not available, and as the need was urgent, 
Mother requested that one of the other ministers go. <clears throat> now, the good, the good brother who went did not have much of a knowledge of social amenities. All right? <clears throat> he, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't all socially acceptable. Okay? In fact, he was a rather rough and ready preacher, hardly to be distinguished for his ministerial polish. I, I just love the way he wrote that. You know, it's, I get an idea of, I kind of I picture a David Hogan type. You know? <laughs> but his faith in God was strong, and though he had acquired a rather brusque, unceremonious manner of dealing with the sick, it produced results even though his mannerisms sometimes offended people of fastidious taste. Right? <clears throat> Again, I just like this guy. Okay? Notice he says, when mother and this preacher arrived at the home of the sick woman, and he had opportunity to observe her critical condition. He lost no time in telling her that the sickness was the work of the devil. Now, you got to picture this. This woman is a well-to-do woman. Her husband is a bigwig in the church, probably very socially, you know, networked, okay? And she's lying in bed sick, probably had everything there, you know, she needed, nice stuff. And and this man walks in who is not known for being just really polite and nice and all that kind of stuff. And he walks in and looks at her and he goes, oh, you got a devil. Now, you know that didn't go over good. Right? Now, watch. He said, after giving the woman some instructions, he proceeded to rebuke the illness with a loud, booming voice that carried through the whole house. Then, rather roughly, he told the woman that she was healed and for her to get out of bed. <laughs> The lady at first hesitated to do this, but shortly afraid to disobey. Mm -hmm. You get that? That's good. She was more afraid of that preacher than she was the pain of that sickness or whatever it was. She, you get it? She, she was afraid to disobey. Now, when was the last time someone was afraid to disobey you? Okay? <clears throat> You're not speaking strong enough. That's one of the things I loved about Dr. Summerall is that <clears throat> he would... He would, he would tell us, you, you, a, a commander commands. Now, actually, Patton said those statements, but what I got from Dr. Summerall was basically, you have to be able to have that presence to be able to command authority. And Dr. Summerall was a prime example of that. I mean, I could give you all kinds of stories about him, but he was just amazing. And, and you know, He would look at you a certain way, and you, even if you were going to disobey or disagree, you didn't. <laughs> you know? And, but this is a kind of... Thing you, I'm telling you, you need this when you go into hospitals. Because if you go into a hospital, I guarantee you, you go in there very much. <clears throat> Doctors and them will come against you to the point where they will try to make you feel that you don't have the authority that they do. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to let them know, no, I'm of a higher authority than you are. Right? And you, be able, you need to be able to speak in a way that shuts them up so you can get your job done. And you also need to be able to speak in a way that shuts up the family if necessary. Right? You need to be able to tell them. Somebody, they say something about, well, you know, go ahead, do your thing. I'm not doing my thing. I'm doing God's thing. Amen. Right? You're just jealous because you can't do it. Oh. Right? <laughs> right? And I, I, do, I do it for free, and you've got to charge. Right? I think if, you, if you're going to pay a doctor, you ought to only have to pay if what they do works. <laughs> right? Anyway, that's, okay. Anyway, he says, but shortly, afraid to disobey, she did as she was told and rose from her bed to discover, and notice this, when she got out of bed was the first she discovered, to her great joy that she was made whole. So when she decided to get up, she thought she was still sick. But she was afraid to disobey him, so she did it anyway. The pastor of the local church was at that time very much opposed to this ministry. <clears throat> this miracle was the first step in convincing him of its reality. Eventually, he became convinced of his scriptural foundation and received a notable healing himself. Hmm, I wonder if that's why their church taught against it. Yeah. Many times when the leader can't get well, they have to come up with excuses so they don't lose face in front of their people. He says, <clears throat> Incidentally, the banker who had loaned the money for the proposed operation was startled indeed a few days afterward to see the husband come to the bank to return the money. Yes. It, was such a, it was a testimony which caused many in the community to wonder and take note. Such were the methods used <clears throat> and the results obtained that gave the work of John G. Lake the prominence that it achieved. Right? <clears throat> now, I'll read one more thing here real quick because I want to get you, I'll get you out of here as quick as I can. But all this has to do with the authority that we've been talking about and what we're going to talk about tonight. 
Next page over is page 80. <clears throat> this is John G. Lake's letter to Carrie Judd Montgomery. Carrie Judd Montgomery, actually, Dr. Lake talks about her magazine called Triumphs of Faith. And it went on for many, many years. It was just a regular weekly magazine type of thing. I believe it was weekly. Actually, it was monthly. Monthly magazine. And again, remember I told you I had all the leaves of healing from Dowie? I've also got all of Carrie Jeb Montgomery's magazines on, on a disc on my computer. And so I'd go through and read them. I've been printing a lot of them out. These are the testimonies and things that we're going to be printing out over the, in the Voice of Healing that we'll be doing. <clears throat> he writes to Carrie Jeb Montgomery, April 22nd, 1911. He says, Dear, now you have to remember, at this time he is in South Africa. And what had happened in South Africa is he went over, great results, people got mad, some people got jealous. They started saying some things and trying to undo the work there and accuse him of some things. <clears throat> and so the money stopped. And when the money stopped, it actually caused, it got to a point where he couldn't send any money out to his missionaries on the field. And so he had to call them all in because they had no money whatsoever. He called them in and said, listen, we don't have the money. You can stay here and work and raise some money and go back out. Or if you want to go back out, you go back out and just trust God. That's, you know, that's what we can do. And they said, would you please go outside so we can talk about this? So he went next door and got a cup of coffee. They, he came back in. When he came back in, they noticed they had all the chairs in a circle. And in the middle of the circle was a table. And on the table was the communion elements. And so he went in and sat down. And they said, no, here's what we're going to do. We've all decided to go back. But we want you to give us communion like a last supper. Because for many of them, it would be. And they said, and all we want you to do is promise that if we die on the field, you yourself personally will come bury us. And they did communion, and he went through it, and he agreed. And over the next year, they buried 14, I think it was, men and women that died on the field, all because, I'll tell you the word, one man was named uh, Cooper, and another man was named Bowie, who eventually became very well known in the Assemblies of God. But at this time, they got jealous, and because of their lies, that was later proven to be lies, these men and women missionaries starved to death because they wrote letters that caused people to stop giving money. And so the people couldn't even say, well, where was God and all that? <clears throat> you still got to eat. And they were on the field. <clears throat> and well, there's a lot more to it. But, you know, at some point I'll be able to share some of that stuff. But, he's, but here, at this point, they had had this trouble. And so they wrote letters. They had a person come over and investigate the work from the United States, check on everything, and find out that everything that they were saying was a lie and that what Dr. Lake had said was true. And so they wrote a letter back to tell everybody what they had found out. So this is a letter Dr. Lake wrote to Carrie Judd Montgomery and had the other letter with it that they were going to send out to all the people to let them know that what had been said about them was not true. Okay? So he says, Dear Sister in Christ, Enclosed, find some letters with incidents, etc., of what the Lord is doing among us. Reverend Stevenson, that's the man that went over to check the work, has arranged for us with a friend for the circulation of the letter which you find enclosed. I regard it, that letter, as a striking example of the force with which this gospel comes to people of open mind and was pleased to have a man of his caliber concerning the work. Of course, he viewed the work on a day when the Spirit of God was moving mightily. It was an extraordinary day, therefore it's only fair to say that all of our meetings do not have the same degree of power that was in that one. So you can tell he's being honest about this and saying, you know, we, sometimes we see greater things. However, we praise God that he is moving strong and steady and clearly. I'm reminded to write you through the reading of Mrs. Anderson's testimony as it appears in the Triumphs of Faith. I haven't a copy of a... Now listen to this. I haven't a copy of a letter I wrote some time ago to a missionary by the name of Hoover at Valparaiso, Chile on the subject of divine healing which embodies what I regard... And he's talking about this letter. What I regard as the secret of the aggressive ministry of healing that the Pentecostal movement of South Africa demonstrates. Now, when I read that, I thought, man, where's that letter? I want that letter, okay? So I started looking for it now, and in my search, I came across this guy. His name is Willis Hoover, and he was a missionary. He was a Methodist missionary in Valparaiso, Chile. He wrote to John Lake, heard about the baptism of the Spirit, wrote to John Lake and said, how do we do this? John Lake wrote him back, told him, and in this letter, it talks about two specific things, and he wrote it back. This man got a hold of it. The man received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and as soon as he got the baptism, the Methodist church kicked him out. So he went across the street, not, not down the block, not across town, across the street, and started the Pentecostal Methodist church. Okay? And he thought a long time on that name, I can tell, from the Methodist church, the Pentecostal Methodist church. 
And then that revival started, and within a short time, that church was the largest denomination, the Pentecostal Methodist Church, was the largest denomination, the largest church in all of Chile and most of South, Af uh, South America. After a while, those people went over into Argentina and took the Pentecostal message to Argentina. Out of the church that they birthed came Carlos Anacondia, came Carl, uh, what's the name, Frison? Uh, can't remember his name. That's it, yeah. All of them came out of that church. Again, Dr. Lake was instrumental in the Argentine revival that ended up getting brought here through Steve Hill that became the Pensacola revival, and so all of this can be tied back to him, every bit of it. Now, <clears throat> watch, he says, uh, I do not know that I will be able to send you a copy of that letter at this time, but at my earliest convenience, we'll have a copy prepared and send it to you. So I'm still thinking, where's that letter, right? And I looked for it, looked for it, couldn't find it. I'll give you the rest of the story in just a minute. I feel, sister, that there is a step in this ministry in advance of what the Pentecostal movement in general enjoys. And God has laid it deeply on my soul to present this particular phase of the exercise of the dominion of Jesus Christ. Now watch, he talked about this letter that had the secret, and he's going to tell you exactly what the secret is. And that the secret of our success here in this ministry is in our teaching our workers to exercise the dominion of God through the Holy Ghost and that he has already put it in their soul when he baptized them. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? He said the secret is the fact that, he, that we exercise the dominion of Jesus Christ over the works of the devil and that he gave us that dominion when we got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now that's the two things that was in that letter that he wrote him. One was the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but the other was manifestation of the sons of God, walking like Jesus with Jesus' authority. Amen. Right? Now, he says, now watch this. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. And that he's already putting it so that when he baptized him. While in other branches of this work, talking about the Pentecostal movement here in America and different places, they still follow largely the old line of intercession for the sick. Oh God, please heal. Oh, you see the difference? They didn't do that. He says, we do not pray for God to come and heal as in the old days. But looking into his face, believing that he has baptized us in the Holy Ghost, and that we have received the power of God through that baptism, we command in the name of Jesus, the devil and his works to depart. There's a secret. Now, isn't that what you've been learning all week? That's what Dr. Lake did. That's what started the revival in South Africa that's still going on today. Been going on for over 100 years. That's what caused the great revival, all the miracles that took place. The works in the healing rooms up in Spokane, over in Portland, 200,000 healings recorded in a 10-year period. All that was because of what he taught right here. Now, he says, Nevertheless, dear sister, there are instances when God puts the spirit of real intercession even for the sick upon you. And I asked Wilford what he was talking about there, and what he was talking about was whenever, when the people aren't in front of you, there are times whenever you will pray longer for them because you're not with them. But when you're with them, you just command. And the difference is, there's no difference in spirit. It's in our perception. Mm -hmm. Because we can't see them, we don't know exactly when it's done. And so we, we tend to go a little longer, right? But that's what it's talking about. Now, he says, I am convinced that there is a secret and better place of interceding for the sick in exercising a dominion of God over the devil and his sicknesses that when learned by the Pentecostal movement will put the ministry of healing miles in advance of where it is now. Now this was 1911. A uh, hundred years, you know, what, six months shy of a hundred years ago. And the church still hasn't got it. They've never picked it up. They are still interceding. They're, they're, we're just starting to see sparks where people are starting to realize, to, to command. But I'm telling you, Listen to me carefully. When we first started doing this 10 years ago, and for, when I first started reading this out, when we first started training people, when that happened, I can tell you, God is my witness, nobody was commanding. Nobody was exercising authority. Nobody was talking about walking like sons of God. The last time that had really been brought up was in 1947 and 48 through people Dr. Lake had taught. After that time, now there was... You know, even in the word of faith, there wasn't a whole lot of commanding. There was believing and there was standing, but there wasn't commanding because they told you you had to have your own faith. Yeah. So there wasn't commanding. There was no exercising Jesus' authority. But once we started preaching this, all of a sudden we started, it started breaking out, and now we started hearing it from here and here and here. And all of a sudden now there's other schools popping up and other people are saying it. But what you have to watch for is a lot of people pe preach authority, 
But the problem is, the other stuff they preach negates what they preach about authority. So you have to be careful what you listen to and make sure that what you're hearing lines up with everything else and never takes away from the authority that Jesus has that you operate in. Amen? Okay, now, he says here, His name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong. Well, didn't I just read that to you? That's Acts 3. Such as I have, give I thee. Aeneas, Jesus, maketh thee whole. Now watch, we have never caught the force of Jesus' words to proclaim liberty to the captive. Do you hear that? The church doesn't proclaim liberty. The church offers liberty. You want to be healed? Come up front. We'll pray. You want to, no, that's not our job. Our job isn't to say, offer healing. Our job is to say, I'm here to tell you, it's done. You're free. Captives, you're free. You don't have to stay sick anymore. You can break out of those chains right now where you are because it's already done. That's proclaiming liberty. Not offering liberty, proclaiming, declaring liberty. Amen? That's the difference. Don't go back to where you come from and slide back in that old thing where you're getting this, you know, we, we don't have anything, we got to pray and beg. You got it. You got what you need. Not because of you, but because of him. All right? He wants you on the field doing the work. He says, Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It was through the healing of a young man from Detroit, Michigan, in your faith home at Buffalo, that my interest for this ministry was first captured. It was not until many years afterward when, through the teaching of John Alexander Dowie, that I really grasped the thing so that the knowledge of the ministry became vital or real. And it was only after I had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost that the dominion of God entered my soul that compelled me to command sickness and the devil to leave rather than to intercede with the Lord to take them away. Do you hear that? See, that's the di that is the difference of JGLM. That's what we're teaching. And if you go home and you got this manual, I, I urge you, read this letter over and over and over. Get this into you. Get, I, have a, I think it's over there. We have a, a deal I taught on the spirit of dominion. You have to get the spirit of dominion. The spirit of dominion has been lost in the church today. But the spirit of dominion is the spirit of Christ. <coughs> Jesus never even acknowledged the possibility of a lack or a possibility of failure. When people came to him, he never said, well, I don't know, let's, let's just see. Well, hope I got the faith for this one. I mean, this, you know, nobody's ever done this. He's been dead four days. Let's just see, you know. Huh. He didn't, you know, let's wait, let me go fast. He didn't, he didn't do that. He, ne he just, whatever, what do you want? What do you want? And they say, well, I want to receive my sight. He said, receive your sight. He didn't, what, what, what do you want? What? He didn't do that. The spirit of dominion. That means when you walk in, you have to realize, when you walk into a room, you are the highest spiritual being and the highest spiritual authority in that room. Why? Because you are a son and daughter of the living God. There's not a devil, not a sickness, nothing in you. Amen? That's who you are. You've got to get that spirit of dominion. You just, you've got to learn to rear up against the enemy. Whenever he rears up and roars at you, you just roar right back at him. Right? You know, when he says, I'm going to take you out, you tell him, take your best shot. And when you're done, my turn. You ever seen those guys try to punch each other out? And the first guy hits him, and the guy just stands there, and he's like, uh-oh. You know? That's the way it is. But it ain't you hitting him. It's Jesus in your fist. Amen? He's the one that hits through you. That's what knocks the devil out of people. It's not you. It's the Spirit of God in you. It's that Spirit of dominion that says, I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Amen? And you start to rise up inside and decide, I have this. Yeah. Not something I'm going to get. I got it. Right? I got what I need. Why? Because God is good. He's not left me here an orphan. He's not left me empty. He's not left me lacking anything. Yeah. Amen. He has filled me to overflowing. <laughs> Amen? I got so much, if I get around you, it'll rub off on you. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? That You need that. Amen. Not, not, well, you know, I want to get around Brother Curry. No. no. Jesus in you. That's right. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not Christ in Brother Curry. Christ in you. Amen? Amen. You're going to go back home where I don't go. It's got to be Christ in you. And you've got to take this thing back. You've got to talk like this. Why? You know, come on. You, well, I'm not sure I believe it. And talk like it till you believe it. Amen. And then when you believe it, you'll talk it because you believe it. But in, see, it is a law of the human mind that you can act yourself into believing faster than you can believe yourself into acting. Amen. You know? Fake it till you make it. You know? I, I, however you want to say it, Okay? I mean, I mean, come on, I'll tell you tonight, I'll tell you the story, but I'm telling you, the first time I really saw this happen in a church setting, 
I was acting like somebody else. I was acting. I'm telling you. I was as amazed as they were when it happened. Okay? So, anyway.